Um, so we are quite honored and fortunate. Uh, when you talk about living legends, historical figures, we can point right to our FCC commissioner, Mignon Clyburn. She is the first woman ever to serve as chair of the FCC. And like many of us in this room, she has had her eyes on fairness, on openness, on a sharing economy. She has truly lived up to what we all hold as, as a valuable uh, part of community, which is economic equality. And she's able to use, in her own position, she's able to add our voice to the debate that goes on in government. And as you know, we recently had landmark decisions made by the FCC, two of them, literally, back to back. One, net neutrality, and the other around municipal broadband. These, are these will be things that will be talked about in textbooks in colleges for years, because it protects every American. And that's why we call her our Beyonce of technology. <laughs> So what the format will be is Clayton and I are going to do a fireside chat with the commissioner where the idea is we're going to really sort of drill down into the thinking behind some of these very key issues which she holds dear and then we're going to open it up um, to questions. Then followed by that will be our two panels both tied into the digital.nyc. So Mr. Banks? Well. Without further ado, allow me to introduce, right? That's what people say I say. Um, Commissioner Mignon Clyburn of the FCC. Let's give her a round of applause. Let's welcome her to New York City and Silicon Harlem. Thank you so much. Good evening, I, I, you know, I'm from the South, so I don't need a booming mic. I, I'm naturally <laughs> booming. <laughs> it's being recorded. That's oh, okay, recorded. Oh, so, um, hello everyone. <laughs> well, um, my mic is on, so now I'm hello? booming all of a sudden. That's good. So we wanted to start the conversation out, and this is conversational, as Bruce mentioned. So start thinking about what you might want to ask. Uh, this FCC commissioner, not that she may answer all of them, but uh, definitely we want to make this an interactive and engaging experience for all of us. But we thought maybe you could start out, uh, Commissioner Clyburn, with just sort of your um, opinion and thoughts around the recent rulings and why, you know, a community like Harlem or any community around the, the country should be paying attention to this. Again, well, good evening, everyone. It is such an honor for me to be in this incredible room. What do you call it? The living room of Harlem. Uh, I like that. Mm -hmm. um, I like that for more than one reason, uh, because with the exception of my grandmother, every grand that I had on my maternal side of the family came up to Harlem to mm -hmm. live. Uh, there were opportunities denied to them in my home state of South Carolina, which I love, uh, but we have and had our set of challenges. And so when you are nurtured in that type of environment, where your parents literally met in jail fighting for freedoms um, that uh, we all enjoy and continue to aspire, it should not be, a, you should not consider it a stretch for me to be a person through this regulatory body called the FCC that this person is interested in closing the gaps, being an enabler of opportunity, ensuring that through a regulatory framework uh, that we do everything we can to equalize and level the playing field. And that, if I were to sum it up in layperson's terms, is what we did on February 26. Mm. We sent out a signal to all, particularly internet service providers, that there will be no 
fast lanes, that there will be no priority given to anyone that you might have a previous relationship, that all traffic is equal, that you choose, the people choose, not the government, not a corporation, but you choose what your legal, let me repeat that, <laughs> your legal uh, engagement is when it comes to your online experiences. So that, in a nutshell, um, is what we did. And this will, it's so appropriate that we're here tonight in um, you know, highlighting the things that you care about because without that level playing field, without that it being enabled uh, to access the, uh, the options, the, the information, uh, the uh, everything of your choice when it comes to online, without those freedoms uh, which we hold dear in this country, um, uh, this one would look different. Mm -hmm. Um, and your opportunities would be different. And so th that is what we are continuing um, uh, to do. Um, it's going to be met with challenges. Uh, you probably already know, I think we're up to uh, at least nine or 10, I stopped counting, mm -hmm. um, of those who think that you know we overstepped our bounds. But what we did was continue building on something that started in 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some internet uh, freedoms that uh, were expressed by the FCC that were principles that companies agreed to abide by. What we found a few years later, that not every company abided by you know, all of those principles. We saw some problems uh, in the ecosystem that we knew needed to be addressed with rules. So in 2010, we set up um, some rules in place, high-level rules that in essence mirror what we ratified once again on the 26th. And we had to do that once again because the court found some deficiencies, not within our logic or reasoning, but within or because of the legal foundation that we use. Again, no blocking, no uh, pay prioritization, no throttling of traffic. That when you sign on, when you attempt to get to that online application, that your experiences should be like everyone else's. And so um, we can talk more about what that means and what more that, that enables that, but that is the reason. And I bring up my family um, history because it, in essence, um, has been a fight for those same types of freedoms. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about freedoms more in a digital, um, a, a digital framework. And so it's so important for every platform that we have ownership of, because it's what you own, ownership of, uh, that the freedoms that we hold dear, uh, that um, we speak of in terms of our, our American experiences, that we have that online. Mm. That's powerful. Thank you so much. Um, we're very fortunate also to have the mayor's office here represented. Uh, there's a new broadband task force uh, led by Maya Wiley and Joshua Breitbart. Joshua, go ahead and raise your hand. He's from the city here. So we're fortunate to have our voice at that table. And we have our voice at that table because just last week, press release came out and our own Bruce Lincoln has been named to that broadband task force. So. Very, very proud, and Harlem is well represented as a result. Talk about broadband, if you don't mind, Commissioner Clyburn. Uh, back in January or so, there was a redefinition of broadband. How does that impact the communities or the, the country? It ensures that no one else's content is favored over yours. Uh, it ensures that when you sign online, that that application in which you're attempting to access cannot be degraded. Uh, it ensures that if you've got a business or an opportunity that you want to uh, let the world know about, uh, that there is not a gatekeeper that is prohibiting that voice, uh, that to be heard. And so this is again, to me, a part of our natural evolution uh, in terms of our American experiences and ideals. It is using this platform, uh, this platform that has just really flattened 
and apparently yeah, we've got some interaction here. <laughs> that's, a, that's a visual, I, I create, that's a visible visual representation in terms of the openness and transparency. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and visual realization that, um, that will enable you to be on equal footing, on par, uh, with even the, the, the biggest of giants. You don't have to have a storefront now. You, you, know, you don't have to pay rent uh, to someone or, or to have most of your resources uh, go to a physical, uh, a physical building in order to be in business. Right now, the world is your marketplace uh, because of, of this experience. And, and what we're attempting to do at the FCC is to make sure that with each decision that any barrier that currently exists is, and I'm from the South, is whittled away. I know y'all don't know what Whitland is. <laughs> but I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. I'm just trying to hide the accent. Um, um, but the, these things are, are, are very near and dear to me because I think I'm an unlikely person to be in this space. You know, I'm not an attorney. You could probably tell by, um, you know, some of my uh, disposition. Um, you know, I'm not from the Washington, D.C. area. I'm from way, way, way outside of the Bay Beltway. And those experiences, I think, are... Um, allow me to be in concert with you. Because what I sense in this room, it's a little warm, but what I sense by, <laughs> what I sense in this room is a desire for you to be on equal footing. That your idea, your concepts, your products, the things that you have developed here, that you have the opportunity to display that to the world. This is why I think at this time, with that decision, um, why I am um, honored to play an integral part of ensuring that your experiences and your expectations are realized in the digital, uh, in this digital age. Yeah, hey, this is, this is incredible. Can you talk just briefly um, about speed? We hear about uh, gigabit networks. We certainly have an initiative here uh, for Gigabit Harlem. Um, and the FCC just redefined what that was from uh, from five megabytes down to one megabyte uh, or one megabytes up to now 25. A, a whopping 25 megabytes down <laughs> and five megabytes up. So can you talk about speed and where we're going with that? Is the FCC going to continue to look at that and how to? I know that it, when you raised that threshold, all of a sudden certain people didn't have broadband anymore. But uh, if you could talk a little bit about where we're headed with that, we always made very clear. Um, that um, we were not going to be stagnant when it came to defining what broadband was. Uh, that, you know, we started out at, what, 763, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. we, it's, it's just so yesterday. <laughs> and, and then we went to 4-1. And then we went to 10-1, in which we're still financing some products. And what the chair made clear is that if you see advertised products, if you talk about mm -hmm. how you are engaging online, when you're downloading and the like, 4-1, 10-1 is not going to cut it. Mm -mm. And so 25-3, um, when it comes, to, like I said, to your experiences and what is advertised, it seemed to be the norm. And that is why we set that baseline as defining what uh, broadband is. Yes, there are some people who are not very happy with that, yes. It does mean that the definition in some areas is a challenge, but I think and I know uh, through a lot of these initiatives, these giga, um, you know, bit initiatives, um, that we can achieve this. Mm -hmm. You've got to have challenging goals and aspirations in order to reach and exceed them. And if we stay in a 4-1 uh, universe, mm -hmm. then we're going to, the vast majority of us are going to have a 4-1 experience and the rest of the world is going to leapfrog from 25-3. So we have to ask ourselves some critical questions. Are we status, satisfied with being stagnant? Or do we want to continue to challenge ourselves uh, to move to the next um, series of levels that we know we need to compete? We deserve to aspire for the best. Mm -hmm. I mean, we. Gigabit, you know, that, that type of speed, that should be the norm because that is what it's going to take for us to compete internationally. Uh, the great part about, um, you know, this open platform is that it opens us up to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. 
The challenging part about this platform is that it opens us up to the rest of the world. It means that you got to compete with Singapore, who has, um, they've got a different governmental structure, I'm here to tell you, I was there. <laughs> It's beautiful, I'm here to tell you. But you tried to do some other things, I'm here to tell you, you won't come back. <laughs> but I want to reaffirm to you that they've got speeds that are out of this world. And they've got industrial um, and, and economic and, and financial and um, you, you know, the evolutions and development that's, that's out of this world. If we want to, to uh, maintain, thank you, I needed to hear that. And we needed to do it, because it, it's really plain. If we want to maintain our relevance in this world, we have got to invest. And that investment has to come through a, a, a challenge means. And that's why it was so significant when the chair made that not so popular decision to say this is what we need to define as real broadband, that we should embrace that and exceed that not criticize it. Mm. See? All right? Just like Beyonce, you get a hand after everything you say. I wish I had a couple other things like Beyonce. We'll work on that. And that is what an open internet platform will enable. <laughs> so as we're talking about this achievable vision of getting gigabit everywhere, it also has changed the discussion as it relates to the E-rate and how you're sort of redefining that. And here in New York, we have a smart schools initiative where what we want to try to do is actually move our schools past the current uh, level we have as far as connectivity. Um, could you talk some about that and how you're sort of rethinking the E-rate? And um, I know we have a lot of ed tech and educators in the audience that would be very interested in that. So what we said last year is that we're no longer satisfied with almost 70% of our schools and libraries not being able to effectively compete, the not uh, being able to uh, download and, and, and take advantage of some of the educational opportunities uh, that um, you know, others have a around the world. And so we put a marker um, down. And we said we're going to uh, invest nearly $4 billion a year to um, you know, have Wi-Fi um, in, in our schools um, you know, and libraries, to really connect uh, with competitive speeds needed to close the educational gaps in, in, in our schools. We've seen it and we know it. Um, not all of our schools um, have the uh, teacher complement or capacity that they need. And if, if you travel around the world, when I, when I go to um, you know, Africa, I have not met anyone who speaks fewer than three languages. Never have I met anyone, it's usually the average is four, but I've never heard anybody speaking um, you know, fewer than three languages. What's the answer in our nation? <laughs> and so if we want to really, if we, if, if we want to level, and again, I keep going back to that, level this playing field Technology is the key. It is the epicenter of all of our national priorities, or our international priorities, because again, we need to start uh, thinking global. So what we're doing here is to make sure that the schools and libraries have the resources, and that's economic, that they need to connect, provide the types of speeds, uh, provide the, the types of um, infrastructure they need to educate um, uh, our children in um, these uh, communities. Because 30% of us do not have broadband at home. That's a reality. And where that 30% is, some of the most economically uh, challenged in our communities, some of the most physically challenged, those are with disabilities, uh, some of the age challenge, like I'm quickly becoming, but I'm glad to be able to say it. Um, uh, that, you know, seniors, um, you know, those with disabilities, those are, are, are lower income, those, um, you know, with some literally see challenges. We need to come to terms with how can we allow or give them the means and the resources uh, to become what they are destined to be. And that is, to me, what this is all about. What do we do? How do we invest 
uh, what kind of regulatory policies do we put in place to allow communities and individuals to be what they're destined to be? Because the current construct without, um, you know, without, you know, ICT, without the investment, um, uh, again, it, it, it's, it's not going to be an American experience that um, you know, we're going to be especially proud of in the next 5, 10, or 20 years. Sorry, we're talking behind your back. That's um, all right. I, I'm real used to that. I'm in D.C. <laughs> <laughs> so if any of you want to come in and, and take a seat, there are a few, uh, some seats up here. Feel free. You can walk, and there's stairs on the other side or up there, whatever. So um, if you're comfortable standing, then so be it. I want to pose a couple more questions. One that I think leads from what you just spoke about to you know, sort of the, the culminating sort of issue that I'd like to address. But we're here in Harlem and New York. We're very urban focused. But within the, what you were talking about with the E-rate or with this kind of universal gigabit broadband, how do we also balance the needs of the rural communities so that we really reach a type of economic equity and parity? So we're doing that in a number of ways at the FCC. We've got a universal service fund, which, in which E-rate is one part of it. Um, but the largest economic part of it is called, we call it now the Connect America Fund. But those of you who are as old as I am, we used to call it the High Cost Fund. And what that fund to the tune of about 4.2 or 4. Point, between 4.2 and 4.6 bill, billion dollars annually, it is providing an economic gap between um, what, uh, what it costs um, you know, to provision service and what is needed for them to be economically viable. Because we know in some of these areas, in, in some of our uh, uh, critical, um, uh, in, in some of our urban areas um, too, even though a lot of this money is flowing to rural areas, that because you don't have these scale economies, now I was an econ major, but I promise I won't go deep. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but if you don't have scale economies, you don't make make up that um, you know that economic difference. And so, what this high cost fund is doing is is providing a gap financing, so to speak. So your phone battery is low. I can't take up care of that with the. E with, um, <laughs> But, but what, what does, again, this is interactive today. So, um, um, and, and so what that fund is designed to do is to is address that. And most of that money is flowing into rural areas to ensure that um, those communities um, have uh, the same or similar uh, types of opportunities that we have in urban centers where you don't have that, um, you know, that um, economic um, disparity. Um, so we're going to start opening it up to, uh, to questions in the audience. Uh, Louis, can you grab that mic right there and, and, and help us out? Louis is actually at the FCC as well, working with, uh, for Commissioner Clyburn, so we're very excited to have him here as well. So we have a question already. Um, and if you could just use your first name if you don't mind. Up, so up, up there, Louis. Way, up that way. It's already on. Yeah, go up that way. So see the gentleman with the... Please keep your questions concise and ask questions. We do have uh, sort of a limited amount of time here now, so I uh, would ask you to keep your, your questions you know, Dr. Abhi Meir, executive producer of World Liberty TV Technology Channel. Thank you for taking the time to uh, address us there in New York, uh, Commissioner. Uh, my question is, uh, can you uh, sh uh, shed a little light on uh, the uh, 5G? As, uh, I was at a uh, conference last week and there was talks of that infrastructure is going to be said. How far are we from uh, actually uh, having 5G with new technologies being connected to higher speeds? As you see, there's so much new technology out there and you need higher uh, uh, connectivity. If you could shed a little light on that, I appreciate that. Thank Probably you. Probably not as much as you um, would like me to, uh, Doctor. You know, one of the things that we um, are seeing with um, our LTE, you know, a build out is that we're we are meeting many of our critical needs. But what's going to happen? I, I think what we're going to see happening is we're going to end up leapfrogging because you know it. If first you went from you know 1G to 2G, then the you know 3G, then you know the LTE. I think, um, and what I the meetings that I've had, um, in the experiment 
um, and some of the trials that um, you know I've been hearing about is is pretty soon when we blink we will be there. Now there are a, a lot of um, you know challenges in terms of spectral challenges and, and the like that um, that I don't know we'll have um, time to talk about. And that's why um, all of the, the incentive auctions and all of the other things that we're doing um, it, it's it's so vital in order for us to um, to really meet the uh, the, the critical um, uh, the demands that um, uh, that the the public has when we talk about the internet of everything. So we can talk a little bit out, offline in terms of where some of the experiments and, and some of the conversations are, are taking place with um, some of the standard setting um, bodies. Um, but um, I, I'm excited and, and, and I know you are to, to see what, um, you know, what's on the horizon and, and, and pretty soon um, the, 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 the bells and whistles that we think we have are going to be so outdated and um, like I said, it, it will be sooner, um, uh, you know, closer to, um, you know, 2020 than, um, than we like to admit. So we'll talk a little bit um, um, offline. Hi, I'm uh, Arthur Ware from uh, Albany. I work with uh, an organization and I'm their technology finance manager and I've been doing this stuff for 25 years. And I probably have a more of an advantage than that most people because I've been working in this space for so long. But a couple of questions that I have. One is, can you talk about the advantages of high-speed networks as opposed to just high-speed or broadband and one-off kind of, you know, um, programs. And also, um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, preemptive ruling with uh, Chattanooga and uh, Wilson. Wilson, you know, because I, I think that's an interesting process and an interesting um, policy conclusion that I think I would like to hear more about if you could. Right, so in terms of, uh, I'll see if I can answer your question. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure, and you can kind of um, you know, bring me back um, in terms of the, the, you said high speed networks as opposed to high speed, I'm sorry, as, in terms of uh, broadband. So you know, one of the things, and it goes back to, um, in essence, what the doctor was talking about in terms of um, infrastructure. And uh, what we are uh, attempting to do now, one of the things that doesn't get talked about in, when it comes to the open internet decision um, is the fact that this is um, a, a very, um, it is at the heart of your question in terms of how do we enable, um, you know, faster, um, and, and, and more, um, you know, robust, um, you know, networks. And so there are a lot of barriers um, to, um, uh, to, to providing um, this infrastructure. There are pole attachment um, issues that are, that are local, um, that the open internet um, item, you know, t talks you know, about. You've you got to have the ability uh, to, um, you know, connect um, in order to provide, um, uh, provide speeds. Uh, there are a lot of other things that are happening. We, we talked about, um, you know, some of the Google experience in terms of their, um, you know, one gig cities. What is that is helping to fuel is more people moving faster um, with their build out and their rolled out plans than they uh, previously expected. So what is happening as more and different players uh, get into um, uh, the um, the market and, and when the FCC is is being very aggressive in terms of getting more spectrum to market. What you're seeing is that infrastructure side of the uh, equation uh, being positively influenced and us moving, um, you know, light speeds ahead of which we predicted just a, a few years ago. So now shifting to what has, um, the other decision that doesn't get too much attention um, that uh, was voted on February 26. What the FCC has um, said that is we're going to take our mandate seriously when it comes to uh, that section in the Telecommunications Act that charges us with removing um, competitive and other um, barriers that would prevent um, advanced services to being delivered to this um, through the, throughout this country. Two jurisdictions, as you mentioned, um, Chattanooga and Wilson, mm -hmm. said that the laws in their states um, the laws that were influenced um, uh, by incumbent carriers, I will be plain spoken, are prohibiting, were prohibiting them for providing the type of network support and infrastructure, high speed internet access to too many communities, including Wilson and Chattanooga. So they asked the FCC to preempt those state laws um, that they felt were barriers, and the FCC did that. Um, we saw that the um, that these laws were kind of contradictory in, in nature. So, say you were living in Tennessee, 
And um, the law said that you can go ahead and provide telephone service all over the state. But when it came to broadband, which would probably ride on the same infrastructure, then you couldn't do so. So we looked at that when we weighed um, you know, those decisions. And we, um, there were also charges that if we grant this and, and what the uh, municipalities were doing would create overbuild in these, na um, in these communities. What we're seeing is so many neighbors without any broadband, not even, we're not even talking about 25-3. We're talking about just above, um, you know, dial up. Um, and and what, do, what are you gonna do with that when it comes to, um, you know, attracting businesses and educating your children? So we looked at all of those things, saw that the environment, that there were too many places where there was basically only one alternative in terms of um, a high-speed provider. And we said these are significant barriers to deployment and, and we made a decision. Now, it only impacts those two, um, those two, uh, two states. Tennessee and North Carolina. If there is another state um, with, um, and there are about 21 or so states with the laws that, that we, we have seen that are, have erected high barriers, that the other 19 or so um, would have to um, you know, file a petition. But all of those things, I think when you're talking about the networks um, and, and, and building, these things are fueling um, um, you know, us to, to move um, and even to leapfrog um, you know, from um, you know, LTE to, um, you know, to 5G. And you're gonna mm -hmm. see some incredible things over the next um, few years that'll be enabling. And you are so fortunate that you are in tune um, you know, with this process and um, inside of this hub. Um, because what my fear has always been is that um, we are, um, I think that's the cut. Um, you know that that we um, we got to ensure that we're enablers and participants and not just consumers. Um, you know of um, you know these uh, great um, uh, you know these great opportunities and and this is what we're attempting to do in a number of ways. Well, due to time, we are going to have to 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 move it forward. So, Bruce, unless you have some other comments, mm -hmm. I wanted to have uh, you, Commissioner Clyburn, um, maybe end with how. A community like Harlem. And by the way, thank. I mean, you notice we have a very smart audience here. I had it's no doubt when I walked amazing. in that that was going to be so. <laughs> so, if you have any closing comments on what our community should be thinking about helping you, right. I know you've got a challenging year ahead of yourself. Is there ways that Harlem and, and communities like us can be of help, or or not? Well, one of the things that I think people do not realize is when you talk about regulatory agencies like the FCC, what an economic enabler we are. Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges, if, I will, if you will allow someone in your group to be the point person, uh, to follow the things that we do, there are going to be a number of things that are coming up um, that are, are, are uh, the incentive auction that I mentioned that's coming up in 2016. We're going to be coming up with rules that I hope will allow entrepreneurs like you to take part in an auction. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to be able to happen unless we do things differently. If it's a winner take all kinds of auction where just the person with the you know highest um, you know checkbook for portfolio mm -hmm. gets all of the spectrum, then things will not change. So we've got some, th some things out there that you need to respond to. If there are different models um, uh, that we need to think about, different competitive bidding models, uh, different ways that we could um, you know, allocate spectrum or competitive or um, uh, bidding credits and the like. Um, these are the types of things that, um, that I challenge you, uh, um, you know, to, to weigh in on. Follow our dockets. We're making some incredible decisions that affect your everyday lives. Um, the Lifeline program is another program that I think would be a key enabler. If we reform that particular program, here are opportunities where you could provide different products that are, are far and beyond what um, people are experiencing today, and you could be a provider uh, that um, is, is enabling your community with better, um, you know, better service. So let, we could talk a little bit, you know, because again, I'm, I'm getting a real hook now um, about, so for, you know, follow our docket, reach out to me. I will be glad to share with you what I, um, what I believe is on the horizon, and um, I will look to hear from you um, how I could be a better policy maker to open up the avenues of opportunities uh, for all of these fine minds in, these room, in this room. Thank you.